So I'm going to welcome you to another one of our Tea and Theologies. This is the last one of this series. So we have been journeying through, gosh, 11, maybe 12 sessions looking at Michael Lloyd's book, Cafe Theology, or dipping in and out of Michael Lloyd's book, Cafe Theology, at least using its structure. And we began by looking at, at the idea of creation, this idea that at the heart of all things, at the heart of all that is is created, there is there is personality and there is purpose. So we've thought a little bit about how things began and we have journeyed to, to today where we're going to think a little bit about how things end up. Now, you might notice my language there. I'm thinking about how things end up, not how things end. And there, there is an important distinction there. Listen, if you get into a conversation with people and you ask them the question, how do you think the world's going to end? You'll have all sorts of unusual conversations that will emerge. In fact, there have been polls done through the decades asking that question. And actually, people's opinions of how the world will end tends to change. So at the minute, no doubt, there are lots of people who will say the world's, the world's going to end when some sort of virus eventually gets the best of all of us. And of course, that's a sort of a manifestation of our own anxieties that we're currently experiencing because of the coronavirus. Or other people might say, no, actually, the world's going to end because of environmental devastation. We, we ultimately, as a people, because of our irresponsible living, will exhaust the resources of the world in which we live in. Um, the, the, the legacy of inappropriate living, its impact on the climate, eventually we're all going to have to uh, leave this planet and populate Mars or something like that. We've gone back a couple of decades at, at the height of the, of the nuclear age and you ask people how the world is going to end, people would probably have said to you it's, it's likely that it will end through nuclear devastation. Someone will press a button and fire a bomb and it's all over. I've just finished watching Chernobyl, which is a, an amazing mini-series. Hard watching, but amazing. And and then people might have said that no, the world's going to end because of, of the acceleration of technology. We are uncovering things that we don't understand. And as a result of it, we put our own well-being at risk. You could go back even further and you could say, well, there's lots of research done whenever the space age was at, at full thrust. There was lots of anxiety around, around alien invasion. There was a whole genre of alien movies where the aliens are coming and, and um, they're going to take over the world. But in the, in the biblical landscape, we don't even have to go that far back to find it. Some folk may have said, no, the world is going to end through, through some kind of biblical apocalypse. And for lots of people, that's been a huge fascination. And it's not just that that's not just, you know, that was back in more religious times. It still has echoes in our culture. Um, six, seven months ago, I watched uh, an, X, an X-Men or an X-Men film. Um, X-Men Apocalypse and and the world's ending there because of the four horsemen of the apocalypse and that's a, a, a biblical reference. But what I want us to think about today is what the Bible actually says about how things end up. And I'm going to put my hands up here and acknowledge something off the bat and it is to say that this would not be an area that I have great expertise. Um, it's not an area that, that I'm particularly comfortable with, biblically or theologically. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to lean very heavily on people who know more than I do. And secondly, I'm going to try and make this one a little bit shorter, a little bit tighter. I always say that and I tend to ramble and tangent, but I don't think my knowledge is strong enough to tangent, at least not convincingly. So I'm going to stick to script a little bit more today and we're going to think a little bit about 
about how the Bible says all will end up. All right, so you know the format. Grab yourself a cup of tea, and if you have a Bible handy, grab yourself a Bible, and let's think about the final victory of God. So I'm going to start this one by going a little bit in the deep end because often the way I structure these things is I often start with a little bit of background and then we get into the trickier territory where today I'm going to do that differently. I'm going to start with some of the sort of trickier ideas and then hopefully we'll find our feet a little bit as we go on. So I'm going to start with a, a particular type of literature in the Bible and it's a literature that we call apocalyptic writing. Now the word apocalyptic is not new. It's it's literature that has a feeling of the apocalypse about it, that, that seems to be about sort of end times. And the most well known is the book of Revelation. But it's not just in the book of Revelation, you'll find this type of apocalyptic literature also in the book of Daniel. He's one of the minor prophets. You'll find bits and pieces in Isaiah and you'll find bits and pieces in some of the other minor prophets. And arguably even in the Gospels you see um, little echoes of it. But apocalyptic literature tends to, tends to flourish at times of social tragedy. Um, when people's worlds literally feel like they are falling apart around them. You know, when people are in times of great anxiety or times of great instability, this type of apocalyptic literature tends to flourish. And that's worth considering because often our, our fixation with how things are going to end up or end times often emerges out of our own sense of being unsettled or our own um, our own psychological anxieties but this apocalyptic literature often it has a certain character it's often sort of fantastical and, and dreamlike um, I'm generous to call it dreamlike sometimes it's even quite nightmarish and um, it's certainly it's, it's otherworldly in nature so we're, we're gonna get we're gonna look at the book of Revelation I'm not going to go through it chapter by chapter because I, I don't think that would be helpful. But if you feel brave, you are welcome to um, pick up the book of Revelation and have a little look at it whilst we go through this. So it starts um, It starts quite normally in some ways. It starts like many of the epistles kind of start as letters to churches. So we have this idea of letters to the seven churches in Asia. And then, as a book, it takes a fairly severe left field turn and we are whisked in spirit with the Apostle or with John and we have the beginning of this incredibly colourful and mystical narrative. And we'll recognise lots of it, even if you've never read the book of Revelation, I can guarantee you, you will know lots of the images from Revelation because they have found their way into popular culture, into poetry, into fiction, into movies. I've already mentioned the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but there is the idea of the beast of the sea with the seven heads, there's the whore of Babylon, there is the the Antichrist, or um, I mean we've all seen the horror films haven't we, there's the 666, the number of the beast, there's the angelic reaper and the grapes of wrath. There's the four angels holding the four winds. There's the star called Wormwood. And there's the New Jerusalem. Um, there, there's lots of images in there. I, I could go on and name others who that um, that sit within popular culture as kind of archetypal, um, as archetypal sort of metaphoric images. And the question for us, as people who genuinely seek to treat the Bible seriously is what the heck do we do with all of that? And there's probably two extremes. There's extreme one which is to just quite simply ignore it. To go, 
that was fine for the crazy world of John, but I don't really get that. I'm going to stick with this Jesus character. I can relate to him. I don't have to deal with the beast of the sea with seven heads and all that kind of crazy talk. So one in one sense, we can ignore it. There's another sense where people obsess over it. Um, there is a whole genre of literature obsessed with trying to understand exactly what this revelation stuff is all about. If we have plenty of it in Europe, but I think it's a, it's a huge market in the US and lots of people will have read the books that the Left Behind series or, or the movies the Left Behind series and they obsess with trying to work out exactly who these characters are meant to be. But the question is this, how should we, how are we to read this type of biblical literature without finding ourselves pulled towards one of those two extremes? Now, recognising this is not an area of strength that I have, I'm going to lean on the wisdom of someone else. And there is a scholar called Michael Gorman who, who writes on um, Paul, but he also writes a lot on the book of Revelation. And he suggests or he points out um, five different ways in which we can approach the book of Revelation. And I'm going to quickly skip through those five ways. And then we're going to move on to something a little bit more concrete. But I think, I do think this is important because I think we don't know what to do with this type of literature. So actually to know a little bit more about how we should approach it, I hope, I think, is going to be helpful. Time for a sip. So, five ways. First, he calls the predictive futurists. Now, don't get overly lost in that name because the name really is not, it's not that important. But you can see even within the name what it is. It's people who look into the future and it's people who are interested in predictions. So, this particular group sees the book of Revelation as as kind of a code that represents future events. So it's a code that we kind of have to crack that explains how things are going to happen in the future. So the people who wrote it wouldn't necessarily have understood what it was they were writing, but it will only be revealed to us when that event happens. This particular idea would have been fairly strong amongst the kind of reformed or evangelical theologians of the time. And often those individuals would have gone to great lengths to try and uncover the codes. So there obviously is not actually a dragon that's going to come out of the sea with seven heads. No one believes there's going to be a dragon. But what the dragon is kind of a code figure for something else. So the challenge of the predictive futurist is to try and work out or guess what the dragon with the seven heads is actually going to be. Now, it's actually a really dangerous way of reading Revelation, even though in some ways it became the kind of predominant way of reading it. And the reason why it's dangerous is it has a huge capacity for people to read in their own prejudices and intolerances upon the text. So an example of that, and without making any sort of theological statement here, an example of that would have been when there was huge tensions between the emerging Protestant and the um, Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. And those tensions were not just theological, those tensions were deeply historical and cultural and they move us into the era of kings and queens and power. 
it became the case that theologians often try to read into Revelations the story of the um, the story of the other. So a lot of Protestant churches began to identify the Pope as the Antichrist character in the book of Revelation. But that's one of the most well-known examples. But there are lots of others. There was a movement in the US that tried to identify the beast with ten horns, which actually is not in Revelation, it's in the book of Daniel, with the European Union. And there are lots of apocalyptic cults that have emerged that have tried to find their enemies within the text or within the images of the book of Revelation. And as you can imagine, if you cast your enemy as the Antichrist or the beast, the permission you give yourself to write that individual off is, is huge. So there's a danger in the predictive futurist. But that's the, that's the first and perhaps still today one of the strongest ways in which people interpret the book of Revelation. There's the second way and they're called the pre torists Again, I don't know why theologians feel the need to make language as complicated as they do, but essentially what the pre torists do, and there's a, the word pre is kind of the giveaway, is they also saw the text as a code. But they thought that the events represented by the code were not events in the future, but they thought they were events that had already happened, particularly around the first century. Some preterists identified Babylon the Great, which is in Revelation, with the, the pagan Roman Empire. And even some theologians, such as N.T. Wright, who we have used before in this series, he identified it with the city of Jerusalem. Most Preterist, for example, will identify that this character of the of the beast with the Emperor Nero, while his mark is often this idea of the mark of the beast, they often identify it as the as the stamped image of the emperor's head, which was placed on every coin in the Roman Empire, and the stamp which was put on the hand or in the mind of all without which no one could buy or sell. And they point that even the even the name um, Nero Caesar, when put into its Hebrew letters um, N R O N um, Q S R N in the Hebrew word um, letters have numeric value, and when you write out his letter, it adds up exactly to six hundred and sixty six. So for those individuals, they say, well, this book of Revelation is not trying to predict something that's happening in the future, it was actually speaking or using the language of, of code to speak to something that was happening in real time. A third way of reading the book of Revelation is, is what he calls theopolitical. So that, that's a mixture of two words, obviously. Theo, which is theological, and the second word is political. So in this view, the text, the book of Revelation, is, is a type of political protest and dissent against the Roman Empire that emerged out of a time of persecution in the first century. And in this view, an emphasis is placed on the kingdom of God as the antithesis of the kingdom of this world. So we're meant to read the book of Revelation as this contrast between two kingdoms. The kingdom of this world, which is represented by, by the beast, and then the kingdom of God, which is the Lamb. There's the fourth reading, which says that that's all interesting, but not really that 
that relevant. We, we read the book of Revelation as poetic. So the text is using this fantastical language to express truths. There is no code to decipher. There is no actual antichrist. There is no actual beast that rises from the water. There is no, there are no four horsemen of the apocalypse. Simply we are using poetic or theopoetic language to express deep truths about God and evil and how God participates in the life of history. And there's the last way of unit, which we may call the prophetic or the pastoral. And it says this, it said, look, this is a text that was anchored in the past. And yes, it speaks very clearly to what was happening in the early church as they experienced the the kingdom of this world violently in the life of the Roman Empire. It speaks clearly to the truth of the past. But by doing so, it is meant to speak to every and each generation of readers. The, the imagery is seen as a challenge and a comfort to show us a heavenly perspective on the events of tyranny that sadly throughout history have been experienced again and again and again and again. There is no one antichrist, there is no one any of these things. But these things repeat themselves every time tyranny is experienced. So where are we left? Now, like I said, we're in the deep end with some of this today. And some people say, actually, the answer to this is kind of an eclectic approach. We should read a book, or we should read the book of Revelations. We shouldn't hide from it. But we should read it historically. It's not a textbook of what's going to happen in the next 500 years. But even though we read it historically, we should recognise that the truth in it is timeless. And it offers us truth for surviving the daily struggles against good and evil that are repeated in every age, in every age, in every age. But we should also recognise within it that there is a narrative right at the end which says that there actually is a time when tyranny is overcome and there is a time when all tears are wiped away. And that's what the final victory of God looks like. So let's think a little bit about this idea of the final victory of God. Um, what does that mean? What is it that we are moving towards? So we begin with this idea in the Christian faith. We begin with the idea that creation has purpose. Um, we are birthed into purpose and we move towards purpose. You know, at, at the very heart of the Christian worldview that there is an optimism. We started off with this conversation about how the world's going to end. We actually don't have that conversation. And there's a misunderstanding to be obsessed with the sort of apocalypse or the ending of all things. That's not what the Christian faith's interested in. It's not the, the ending of all things, it's the renewing of all things. The final victory of God is, is optimism. It's not extinction. We, we are, are moving towards renewal and we are moving towards purpose. So I want to just say a few short things about what that final victory of God looks like. And the first one is this, the victory of God will be in time. Now here's what I mean by that. Um, and we have to remember something that we thought about when we looked at resurrection. 
God's, God does not take us away from this earth. As we see at the end of Revelation, actually, is that God does not bring us away into heaven, but that God brings the new Jerusalem onto earth. And we see that right at the end in the book of Revelation. And if you do want to follow along, I know we haven't done much of that so far. It's in <coughs> Revelation verse 22. And listen to the, the re refrain. We see it in verse um, 7, verse 12, verse 17, and verse right at the end at verse 20. Verse 7, see I am coming. Then we jump into verse 12. The exact same thing is said again. Um, see I am coming. And then we jump into verse 17. The spirit and the bride says, come. And let everyone who hears say, come. And let everyone who is thirsty, come. And then we jump right up to the end. The last two verses in the Bible. The one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. The prayer in Revelation is not, Lord, take us away from this place so we may be where you are. That's not the final victory prayer that we find in Scripture. The prayer is, come, Lord Jesus, come. Which is why Christians always have this belief in the second coming. Again, it's not that Jesus takes us away, but rather Jesus comes and makes all things new. Jesus comes and transforms, brings justice to those who have been denied justice, and creates a world where there is no more suffering and no more pain. So the final victory of God will be in time. Second thing is this, the final victory of God will involve a separation between good and evil. Now we're going to have a look, there's a number of texts that we could use that would illustrate this, but one of them is in Matthew 13. And Matthew 13 verse 24 and we'll read it up to verse 30. So he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. The slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in the field? Where then did these weeds come from? And then he answered, An enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weed, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barns. Then there are other texts we could have used. We could have jumped on a little bit of Matthew. We could have looked at this image of separating the sheep and the goats. Within scripture, we see good and evil intertwined. And psychologically, that's the truth for us. There's an easy misread of a text like this that divides the world into the good guys and the bad guys. So the, the good guys get to go over here and the bad guys get to go over there. And psychologically, that's just not how we experience the world. And actually, psychologically, it's not, or theologically, it's not how we are to understand the human person. It's not a scriptural anthropology. It's not how we see human beings. In our world, good and evil are intertwined. And we know that because our motivations are always mixed. We know that one day I can be my best self and one day I can treat people really well and the next day I can be incredibly um, cruel and I can be a difficult person to be with. 
And that's the reality. There is good and evil intertwined within us. And in many ways, we, we hate that. It's like that verse that Paul says, where he talked about the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't, or the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. And we recognise within our own sense of personhood, this, this kind of tension of behaviour. But ultimately what we long for is a world that is free from cruelty and malice and injustice. And if we are honest, we long to see a world where we are not just free from that externally, but we are also free from it internally. The third thing that's related is this. The final victory of God will involve judgment and the destruction of evil. And listen, judgment is a really tough word and we gravitate away from it. And we talk about the virtue of being non-judgmental and I affirm that. But actually, judgment is also important because good judgment is what stops me from making bad decisions. Good judgment is what makes one ideal more worthy of trying for than another. We cannot understand value without making some sort of judgment. And anyone who has, who has hit a hard point in their life has made a value judgment that that is not okay. But we also can't understand justice without some sort of understanding of judgment. In Revelation 6, we have the martyrs, people who have been destroyed by the horrors and tyrannies of the Roman Empire of their day, whose families were destroyed, who were brutally, brutally abused and murdered. And they cry out to God, how how long, Sovereign Lord, before we experience justice? And I would have feel if God simply said, never, you will never receive your redress, you will never receive justice, you will just need to learn to live with it. And for us who feel a little bit queasy about this idea of judgment, we have to somehow learn to reconcile ourselves to what that means. I don't have this image in my mind when I think about the final victory of God. That God just finds a great big pit for all the wicked and chucks them into it. I don't sit comfortably with that idea of that being a final victory. But I do still hold to the idea that justice is important. And I hold to this idea that if we are going to take justice seriously, and if we are going to find a world that is true and fair and free and all of those good things, then there needs to be judgment and the destruction of evil. And the last thing maybe is to say this, the final victory of God is something that we are meant to long for. In scripture, the final victory of God draws things together. In scripture, the, the final victory of God puts all things right. In scripture, the final Victory of God brings wholeness and healing to the broken, sets captives free, liberates the oppressed. The final victory of God restores the weak and exalts the humble. The final victory of God makes most sense for those people who say, how long? Which is why 
the kingdom of God is this kingdom of the upside down. The final victory of God restores all things, renews all things. So thanks be to God for that. So we've come to the, the end of this series of Tea and Theology. I hope you find it useful. We were often in the deep end with some pretty meaty topics, but I think that's not a bad thing for us to do. It's important for us to, to wrestle, to authentically wrestle with some of the big questions of faith. It's what it means to be people who, who seek not just milk, but seek a little bit of meat as we as we decide intentionally not to duck hard questions. We are at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few weeks and just give people a chance and give me a chance to catch my breath. I've had lots of lovely emails during the week from people who have said that they have found this series to be helpful. And for me to think about ways in which we might keep it going. So I, I am going to do that. We'll have, I'll have a look at maybe a, a new angle or some new topics that we might explore. So keep an eye out on the YouTube channel. If you follow our Facebook in Kilturnham Parish, keep an eye on the Facebook and we'll find a way of picking this up again. This is in from Tea and Theology and this online vlog. Um, I thank you and I raise my cup to you. God's blessing.